Titan. Uh, and it speaks to not just um, his, uh, his skin color, but also just in terms of uh, a certain luster about him, a certain uh, radiance that uh, he gave off. And he was adored uh, and reviled uh, equally uh, by you either loved him or you hated him. The folks who loved him were folks who uh, respected him as a, as a person. And the folks who hated him were folks that the, 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 the hate was rooted in fear. To give you an example, uh, Pablo Picasso, as a little boy growing up in Spain, uh, when the little boys in his community would play war games, mm-hmm. all the little Spanish boys mm-hmm. uh, wanted to. Uh, they, they they all wanted to assume the role of uh, Antonio Maceo. The wow. same way little boys little boys and girls now playing basketball say, "I'll be LeBron." No, I'm LeBron. I'm LeBron. They were saying that about Antonio Maceo. Little Spanish boys and girls. We're talking about. Um, it's akin to little boys and girls in, so, in the so United States wanted to pretend to be Ho Chi Minh during right, the 60s. The most years. famous person within their cultural sphere. Well, so you're saying in the 19th century, Antonio Maceo was a well-known, celebrated, also reviled, but just popular figure. People knew about him across the Atlantic Ocean. But reviled because he was... Of his success. Because of his success. He, he was greatly feared by the Spanish... Um, and not just within uh, Cuba and its its uh, enemies in Spain, as Cuba was tr- trying to free itself from Spain. Uh, but when news of his death came to the Italian Parliament in Rome, um, they held a, a moment of silence in in, in homage to him. Uh, obituaries uh, to uh, in in his honor were written on the occasion of his death in diverse languages, including in Yiddish. Wow. So I mean, even the Pope knew about this guy. Can you tell us a little bit about his background? I mean, why would the Pope take take notice, and why would why do people remember him in Yiddish? It sort of speaks to an even you know greater legacy or impact globally. Well, Antonio Maceo is in the promotion that we've been doing for this event. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been describing him as a genuine West Indian hero, a Caribbean hero. Okay. Uh, because Antonio Maceo was born in Cuba. He fought for Cuban independence. Uh, but there's documented evidence that um, he was interested in, Cuba, in Puerto Rican independence. Mm-hmm. Um, he was also interested in the creation of a Grand Republic of the Caribbean anchored by Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti. Mm-hmm. Um, he spent a great deal of time in exile in between wars of independence in Jamaica. His mother died in Jamaica. Wow. Uh, he was uh, very well known and very popular in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and the Bahamas. And raised some troops, I believe, in Costa Rica. I was Co- Co- Costa Rica, uh, Honduras, uh, spent mm-hmm. time in Panama. Um, he was somebody who had very humble origins, uh, essentially a middle class background. His father was a, a, a retired soldier, and he became small mm-hmm. small landowner, um, and a large number of children, mostly uh, uh, boys, the Maceo men, if mm-hmm. you will, and almost all of them died fighting for Cuba's independence. Um, he basically started the outbreak of the first official war of wow. independence in 1868 as a as a uh, somebody in his late teens as a buck private, and within months. Uh, had ascended to uh, uh, to the rank of, uh, of a high-ranking officer uh, purely based on merit because, again, we're talking about uh, this was a young man of color, mm-hmm. uh, of you know, some education. Humble, be, be a basic, humble origin. Yeah, very humble. He wasn't aristocratic but at all. Today, the euphemism is from the bottom to the top, and this is a 19th century patriot or American yeah. who sort of fulfilled that motif. Absolutely. And, and, and let me just interject here um, because as a student of history, I mean, many people know this is doing a radio show. I'm mm-hmm. also... Somewhat of a, a historian, you mm-hmm. know. I got a DVD just out, resurrecting Black Wall Street, right? Uh, speaking about the Tulsa episode of nineteen twenty, Greenwood, yeah, about the Greenwood massacre. But um, in this case, Antonio Maceo, man, it's a name that, um, based on your description, I think deserves a lot more in terms of just resonance, and not just uh, resonance nationally, but especially in a community like South Florida. And and you're saying here that. He may not be as resonant because of his skin color. Yeah. Because that kind of speaks to some of what maybe some of the ongoing uh, social issues between groups are here in Miami well, today. Well, I mean, it's ongoing, I think, is a good way of describing it because mm-hmm. we're not talking about anything that's new to Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been a lot of polarity in Miami. Tensions uh, between blacks and Cubans? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, well, it was specifically, it, and it just kind of it, it shifts, it's very fluid. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, born and raised in Miami. Um, it's not just African Americans and Cubans. It might be, uh, you know, between this ethnic group and another group. Asians, it might be with, Jamaicans. It might be within certain groups, even within, even within the Cuban community. There might mm-hmm. be some division between the Cubans who came over in this year versus in that right, year, right. and uh, and so on. So it's part of the milieu then of uh, South Florida political turmoil and. You know, yeah, I mean, points of contention and issues. Greater Miami is a very polarized place. Now, it's not to say that's it's, it's also polarized in the sense that not everything is polarized. There's a mm-hmm. lot of harmony, 
uh, a lot of folks that interact uh, quite uh, uh, quite harmonically mm-hmm. uh, here in South Florida, which is one of the challenges. And I think one of the things that we've been trying to put all of the the promotion uh, and encouragement about this event, where we we made the decision to go ahead and describe it as a West Indian event because this is Caribbean American Heritage Month number one, mm-hmm. and we didn't want this to be just a Cuban uh, event because Antonio Maceo um, is important outside of Cuba, and we wanted people to feel welcome in it. For example, um, in Clarendon, Jamaica, there's mm-hmm. a school named after Marcus Garvey and Antonio Maceo. Antonio Maceo. Okay. In Kingston, in Monument Park, where they have uh, wonderful monuments to Cuba, Jamaica's many national heroes, there's a bust of Antonio Maceo. Wow. Um, you know, there's a significance for Antonio Maceo, and even within... Uh, African American circles. That's uh, right. If you look at, you know, a lot of jazz is played here on the show, and, and older jazz heads are familiar with Maceo Parker. That's right. Maceo Parker is one of many uh, African Americans named after the Bronze Titan, because when Antonio Maceo rose to prominence and, and started gathering mm-hmm. accolades, all of them deserved. Uh, this was at the time of Reconstruction, at the onset of Jim Crow, and mm-hmm. and, and a certain uh, racial casteism, to borrow from Michelle Alexander's mm-hmm. uh, book. The new Jim Crow. Uh, the new Jim Crow. Uh, as that was being entrenched in a new manifestation, uh, African Americans who were looking for strong role models looked at the headlines. They heard about the story of Antonio Maceo down in Cuba and throughout the Americas. I mean, his name rang bells Absolutely. at the turn of the last century. But his, in but fact, he, mm-hmm. um, uh, I know Eric Foner in the 1970s mm-hmm. wrote what is considered to be the definitive biography on Antonio Maceo. And before that, the only other tome that dedicated uh, to this leading founding father almost of the Americas was Arturo Schomburg, another mm-hmm. uh, Afro-Latin right. figure who was major in Harlem, mm-hmm. major in the right. Harlem Renaissance, one of the fathers of the Harlem Renaissance. He wrote a biography of um, Antonio Maceo as well. But I think the thing that helped with, with Schomburg was the fact that Schomburg was essentially uh, alive mm-hmm. uh, not too long. Basically, their lives he was intersected. almost a contemporary. Uh, practi- almost. Had, had Antonio Maceo not died in combat mm-hmm. um, uh, after the conclusion of one of the great military uh, 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 endeavors of modern time, the invasion of Western Cuba, mm-hmm. which is a whole other conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they probably would have certainly interacted. I told to the Schomburg being Puerto Rican also, mm-hmm. uh, the fact that Schomburg was incredibly curious about history and, mm-hmm. and insatiable in trying to get down to the bottom of it. Oh, he may be America's premier bibliophile in terms of collector of mm-hmm. books and yeah. uh, uh, prop, uh, pro- propagating history yeah. as a as something to be studied. Absolutely. It's a foundational character. Absolutely. It doesn't get enough credit. In my no, opinion. no. I mean, it, it's a lot of credit has to be given to, to Arturo Schomburg. Uh, and, and thankfully, his name carries resonance uh, in academic and even social circles here in the United States, uh, thanks in uh, no small part to the Schomburg Center in New York. That's right. But certainly, Schomburg, uh, uh, Eric Foner's book, which is the only book in English that's, uh, that exists uh, on Antonio Maceo, Folks may not know, but Eric Foner is considered uh, one of the 20th century's uh, most important historians. Mm-hmm. And for him to take some of his academic uh, uh, life to spend on Antonio Maceo mm-hmm. sp- spoke volumes. And he wrote the book in the 70s. 1977 right? was when the book was published. So that's still, I, I still don't understand then why the name Antonio Maceo almost, to me at least, maybe my, my perception is wrong, appears to be like one of these lost historical figures in terms of impact. I mean, for instance, uh, I just saw on Netflix Mm -hmm. um, a a biography of Simone Boulevard, Mm -hmm. worthy of a biography. I Mm -hmm. mean, Simone Boulevard is a premier Mm -hmm. uh, patriotic figure for the Americas, right? Defined Latin America, South Mm -hmm. America as American as anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Practice all the virtues Mm -hmm. and patriotism. And, you know, we know about Fidel Castro. Mm-hmm. We're seeing, uh, we're in an era where film is tackling um, what went on in the Dominican Republic in terms of revolution. Nobody is tackling Maceo. And then you're saying here in this Miami neighborhood, there's a statue but no nameplate. I'm pretty sure if I went and asked nine out of, uh, if I just asked uh, ten random people on Miami streets who may or may not be of Cuban heritage, if they knew who Antonio Maceo was, I'm shocked that uh, you know folks would even know. Wait, wait, let me give you an, exa- an mm. example to illustrate this. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on on a su- Saturday or Sunday morning, mm-hmm. when I was by there, and I was you know and what's what, the location here? This is at the intersection of Southwest 10th Street and Southwest 13th Avenue, just okay. off of A Street, just and off that, of the. And that's area. where the event this weekend will be. That's exactly what's going to be on Sunday evening. All right, all right. Um, as I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a couple out there, and um, turns out they're from Texas, and I asked them if they know 
who this bust is uh, dedicated to, they said they do not. Would you like to own it? Sure, we'd like to. As we're going over the history, a lot of the conversation that we're having now, I see, and they're trying, they're they're having difficulty wrapping their mind around. But why would him being black make a difference? Mm-hmm. And as we're talking, a little old lady, maybe in the sixties, seventies, kind of shuffles on by with a little mm-hmm. plastic shopping bag full of uh, her groceries. Yeah. And I ask her in Spanish, "Pardon, ma'am, are you Cuban?" She says, "Yes, I am. We're in Cuba. From I'm from Havana." Okay. So I said, "Do you know who this person is?" And I point to the bus. She looks at it. She shakes her head. No, I don't. Mm-hmm. And I kind of pause, and I was like, "Ma'am, are you sure?" Mm-hmm. So then she goes and she peers in a little bit closer, and there's a little plaque that doesn't have his name on it, but has one of his more famous uh, sayings, which says in Spanish, "Liberty is in beg for it's conquered by the blade of machete." Mm-hmm. So she reads that and she guesses Maximo Gomez, the, the the Dominican journal who you alluded to a few minutes ago. Mm-hmm. And I said, "No, it's Antonio Marcel." She said, "Ah, same thing," and then she kind of shrugs and keeps on going. <laughs> and and this is. You know, it, it's and this is a Cuban woman mm-hmm. um, who I'm assuming, based on age, even if she would have come here in the 1960s, like a lot of Cubans did, she still was based on her age was pretty close to adulthood when mm-hmm. she left Cuba right. uh, and living in Miami all this time. And ironically, Domino Park, which is named after Maximo Gomez now, was originally named Antonio Maceo Park. So they replaced Maceo with Gomez. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Antonio Maceo was at all times in the chain of command in the hierarchy of, mm-hmm. the, of the Cuban Revolution Army, reporting to Maximo Gomez. Okay. Uh, Maximo Gomez was a uh, uh, very experienced, uh, uh, very skilled uh, uh, strategist and even mm-hmm. tactician, uh, but there was a lot of it, I think, centered around the fact that Maximo Gomez was also white, mm-hmm. um, Antonio Maceo was black, and the, the detractors, the Spanish detractors, the white uh, Cuban Tories, if you want to borrow from the mm-hmm. American independence struggle, uh, they would try to scare white Cubans and even some into uh, staying loyal because into staying lo- of the threat of Maceo. But or, 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 it was too threatening a figure. Or, or what they what they said another Haiti. They right. said this represents this is another Haiti, and this That's is proof right. of it. Their, their best general mm-hmm. um, is a black man. So mm-hmm. Antonio Maceo being very cognizant of that, and also seeing how he allowed inter- himself to play second fiddle. He, he he did that knowing that there was a lot of folks that passed him over for promotion specifically because of racism. The Cuban War of Independence stalled at ten years. Mm-hmm. Uh, largely because of internal strife, a lot of division. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a lot of uh, provincialism and a lot of things, but there was a lot of division within the ranks, and quite a, quite a bit of it was based on on matters of race. Essentially, it delayed the uh, the birth of an uh, of an independent Cuban nation mm-hmm. much longer than it should have. Well, um, strikingly enough, in the past year or so, maybe two years or so, we've mm-hmm. seen um, Antonio Maceo's name resurface. Um, Dr. Henry Louis Gates on his uh, recent series, uh, Africans in Latin America, I believe that's the name Black, of the Black and Latin America. Black and Latin America, mm-hmm. on one of the uh, features in Cuba, spent some time dealing with, you know, why the memory of Antonio Maceo yeah. may have been forgotten. It's it, it's a lot uh, akin to what you're describing it's a great It's a great segment. It's mm-hmm. it's not as long as we'd like it to be, but it's longer than other folks would, so I'm very grateful to Dr. Gates. Uh, <laughs> but nothing, right? <laughs> well, it, well it, it's, it's, a, it's a significant part of it because it was widely viewed by people. Uh, mm-hmm. He interviewed some fantastic... He talked to Ada Ferrer, who's uh, a, a, a scholar whose work I've admired for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, talked to her in Santiago. He interviewed Graciela Chayu, mm-hmm. uh, who I'm a big fan of as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he also talked to uh, Tomas Fernando Rovina, okay. uh, who a uh, fantastic historian as well. So Dr. Gates talked to some very uh, significant people. So the fact that he spent, I think it was about seven minutes uh, of that one-hour segment uh, on Antonio Maceo, I think is credit to, to Dr. Gates' his own curiosity because it's, it's somebody that Americans knew about mm-hmm. and we've forgotten about. I'll give you an example. Just two days ago on Monday, mm-hmm. as I was going through online archives, mm-hmm. I had to stop at about 10. I was looking through uh, birth records and draft records uh, for Northern Florida among African American and white men, including mm-hmm. some of the enlistees that enlisted for service for the United States during World War I. Uh, a lot of them were named Maceo. Naming their kids Maceo. Including at least two, at least one white person, mm-hmm. uh, at least one white soldier. And these were, these were guys that were born in the late 1890s. So they were just old enough to, to fight in, in, in France yeah. during the First World War. Most were named, uh, uh, most of the Marseilles were African American. There was at least one that was white. Wow. Significant. Well, I'm, you know, this is a fascinating topic. You're, I mean, we're taking uh, Antonio Marseille beyond Cuba, mm-hmm. the place where his the history was made mm-hmm. in terms of fighting the Spanish, and now 
introducing him on a global basis on something much and and we have to do a second can you stick around for a second Absolutely. second sure. all right so we're, we're, we're going to take a quick break here folks and we're going to come back and, and, and hopefully answer some of your questions on